Hello everyone and welcome to the webinar Choose Safe Places for Early Child Care and Education Planning, Guidance and Protection. My name is Jonathan Marks from Inkwill Medical Communications and I'm honored to be here today with Tara Summers, RN and MSN MPH. We're very uh, happy to be presenting this webinar. It's, a, it's an important new program from ATSDR. Tara, why don't you take it away? Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tara Summers. I work with the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, and I'm excited to share with you the work we're doing to help ensure that early care and education programs are located as safely as possible. Our traditional site work, we encountered early care and education facilities that were located on or adjacent to sites that put children at risk for environmental exposures. This project is a proactive initiative to keep children from being exposed to environmental contaminants while they attend early care and education programs. Our mission with the Choose Safe Places for Early Care and Education is to ensure that early care and education centers are located where chemical hazards have been considered, addressed, and mitigated to best protect children's health. Some objectives for today's webinar include some background information on early care and education citing issues. This is called, we often abbreviate it as ECE. An overview of ATSDR's work on safe siting of ECE programs. Some examples and case studies. An overview of the ATSDR's Choose Safe Places for Early Care and Education Guidance Manual. And examples of materials and resources to begin and sustain safe siting programs. So a little bit of background about ATSDR for people who are not familiar with us. ATSDR is a federal public health agency created in 1980 with the passage of the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act, CERCLA, also known as the Superfund Act. ATSDR is charged under the Superfund Act to assess the presence and nature of health hazards at specific Superfund sites to help prevent or reduce further exposures and illnesses that result from exposures and to expand the knowledge base about health effects from exposure to hazardous substances. ATSDR shares top administration with the Center for Disease Control and Prevention and is headquartered in Atlanta. Outside of ATSDR headquarters in Atlanta, ATSDR has 10 regional offices located across the country and an office in Washington, D.C. So this is a map that shows our ATSDR apple tree states. ATSDR also funds 25 states to perform some of the traditional ATSDR site assessment work. Those states are shown in green. Apple Tree stands for the ATSDR Partnership to Promote Localized Efforts and Reduce Environmental Exposures. Our Apple Tree Cooperative Agreement states identify and evaluate public health implications for exposures, educate communities and local health professionals, review health outcome data, recommend actions to protect health, and work with other agencies to have protection actions taken for sites. In 2007, ATSDR required that our Apple Tree Cooperative Agreement states start working on early care and education site issues within their state. So ATSDR has worked on dozens of sites across the country where early care and education programs were placed on or adjacent to incompatible sites. These sites can be found in all types of communities across the United States. We noticed these sites come to our attention after children were in locations where exposures to environmental contamination could cause adverse health effects. ATSDR decided to focus on trying to prevent these events by helping to ensure that the site or location of an early care and education facility is carefully considered before children are present at the site. Early care and education programs can go by many names, including child care centers, daycares, preschools, nursery schools, and Head Starts. They can be for-profit, non-profit, or publicly funded. We focused our work on larger licensed centers for a few reasons. First, focusing on the license program gave us a way to reach each program. Each state requires some early care and education licensing. However, it's important to know that some places where children are cared for may not have to be licensed based on the state's individual regulations. Second, many larger centers are licensed and provide services to more children than most home-based or family-based programs. And three, because they are the larger facilities, they tend to be located in commercial or mixed-use zones rather than in residential zoned areas. Residential zones can certainly have their own environmental challenges, but they tend to have fewer formally used or adjacent incompatible sites. Although we are focusing on the larger early care and education facilities, 
the two safe places concepts and materials can certainly be applied to home-based or family-based programs. We've also been asked about the applicability of this work to other places where children spend large quantities of time, such as group foster homes or even adult residential homes. We believe this work could be applied to those programs as well. Sometimes people ask why we're focused on early care and education programs. There's been a lot of really great work brought to the attention of school siting over the past five to 10 years. However, early care and education programs have some important differences than schools, and we felt like focusing on the early care and education programs, we could fill a gap. Some ways that early care and education programs are unlike schools include enrollment in early care and education program is voluntary and not mandatory, which makes it challenging to sometimes determine how many children are in these programs. Second, many ECE programs programs are either privately owned or operated, and unlike schools, there is frequently very little input into where they're located. Third, as previously mentioned, because they're often considered businesses, they're often located in places such as strip malls, old mills, or other places that were once businesses. Many places schools are not typically found. And finally, most early care and education programs are licensed at the state level. Licensing allows for an opportunity to help ensure that these programs are located on safe sites. Most children in early care and education programs are between about newborn to five years old when they can start attending kindergarten. Obtaining the exact number of children in ECE programs or even just in childcare centers can be very challenging. Based on 2014 data from NARA, there are about 110,000 childcare centers in the United States. This is based on licensed child care centers only. There are many children who also attend non-licensed early care and education who would not be counted in these numbers. To get to the number of children in child care centers, we can look at the number of licensed child care center slots, which is about 9.8 million. If you figure 85% of those slots are within the larger child care centers, that's about 8.3 million available child care slots within these child care centers. These slots are not always filled, so the number of children within childcare at any time is probably about 8 million children. Children can spend a great deal of time in these early care and education programs, and it isn't uncommon for children to spend up to 50 hours a week within their own individual program. Physiologically, children are not just little adults. For example, their rates of breathing and their breathing zone are very different than adults. Their metabolic rates are higher relative to their size, and they have a larger ratio of surface area to body mass. These and other physiological differences combined with rapid body development can make them more vulnerable when exposed to environmental contaminants. Also, children have behaviors such as mouthing objects, which my daughter is doing in that photo, and playing on or closer to the ground, and that can expose children to a greater amount of contamination if there are contaminants in their environment. Young children also totally rely on adults to keep them safe from all types of hazards. Also of concern at early care and education programs are women of childbearing age. If you walk into any ECE program, you'll observe that most of the workers are women and frequently young women. This observation is backed by data from the US Department of Labor with about 95% of childcare workers being women. Since some environmental contaminants can cause harm to developing fetuses even in the early stages of pregnancy, protecting women of childbearing age from environmental exposures also helps to protect their children too. In 2010, ATSTR reviewed the state licensing requirements for all 50 states in Washington, D.C. We found most ECE programs were not required to conduct a site history and environmental site assessment or any other type of environmental audit to obtain a license. As our ATSDR work on safe siting for early care and education programs began to ramp up, other changes were occurring in the early care and education realm. All states require some type of ECE licensing, and many states have health and safety inspections, which are critical to protecting children from many types of hazards, including things such as fire, storage of cleaning chemicals, and prevention of infectious diseases. However, these inspections rarely included consideration of environmental exposure based on location. The Administration for Children and Families, ACF, is a federally funded agency that oversees the Child Care Development Fund through their Office of Child Care and also administers the Head Start program. In 2014, 
the Child Care Development Fund block grant was reauthorized and requires the lead agencies in each state must have health and safety requirements in place for child care providers that serve children receiving the Child Care Development Fund assistance. These new health and safety requirements cover 11 topics, including building and physical premise safety. As states work to adopt this ACF health and safety requirements, there is still wide variation within state licensing. The work we are doing at ATSDR with Choose Safe Places can tie into these health and safety requirements and help prevent environmental exposures. What we would like you to think about today is when a child care center or Head Start or preschool or any other ECE facility is being built, moved into a new space, or is licensed, who is asking the question, what was this site before it was a daycare? What business is adjacent to this child care center? And what are the nearby environmental hazards? Unfortunately, there are many sites which ATSCR or our state health department partners have assessed where environmental contaminants impacted early care and education facilities. In New York, the child care center was adjacent to the Jackson Steel Federal Superfund site, and when it was discovered, it caused a great deal of concern. A New York Times article titled, Parents Fear, a Monster in the Playground, was written about the site. Sampling found levels of perchloroethylene, also known as PERC, that exceeded state limits inside the child care center. A new ventilation and a vacuum extraction system under the building's foundation had to be installed to remove the PERC vapors. We know that people who operate and work in early care and education programs deeply care about children, and they often go well above and beyond basic requirements to keep children safe. When my family moved and we were looking for a new child care center for my toddler, during the tour of the facility, I was told about the fantastic curriculum for the babies and all the features of the newly constructed center. However, when I asked the director, what was this before it was a child care center? She suddenly got a little bit nervous and said, why? No one's ever asked us that before. I tell this story to illustrate that many times the past history or possible environment exposures at an early care and education location are considered simply because no one knew what exactly to ask for or what to consider. So this next one is a case study. We're gonna talk about a few case studies. So an example of a poorly cited early care and education program is that of Kitty College in New Jersey. We use the actual name of this child care center because it is such a well-known case and because the child care center was forced to close. In 1994, Accutherm, which manufactured thermometers at the site, shut down. In 2001, the building was purchased by a local realtor. And in 2004, a child care center moved into the facility. In 2006, they had to shut down when high mercury readings were discovered in the building. 72 children and nine staff that had been attending and working at Kitty College had their mercury levels tested. About one third had urine mercury levels greater than what's considered to be the normal range. The legal and financial fallout was long lasting. In 2014, a judge ordered the property owners pay 6.1 million in cleanup costs and punitive damages to the state of New Jersey. Parents concerned about the long-term health impacts also fueled a class action lawsuit. The lawsuit settlement of $1.9 million provides money to fund long-term medical monitoring program for the exposed children. Just one of these sites can cause a great deal of anxiety and distrust among parents. The sites are popular for press coverage with scary headlines such as toxic conditions found at local daycare. In some cases, the child care centers lost business or closed and lawsuits followed. Preventing even one of these sites not only protects children, but also preserves the public faith that child care and other early care and education facilities are safe places for children. We at ATSDR have also worked on sites where early care and education programs were impacted by contamination from adjacent businesses. In 2008, ATSDR and our Apple Tree partner in Wisconsin worked on the child care center which had problems due to being adjacent to an incompatible business. The child care center was in the same building which housed a gas station convenience store. The child care center was reported to the Wisconsin Department of Children and Family Services for odor. It was discovered there was a small gasoline leak from the gas station, which was believed to be the cause of the gasoline smell. Indoor air samples were taken and showed that benzene and xylene were at levels above ATSDR health comparison values and that benzene created an unacceptable increased cancer risk 
if people were exposed for more than one year. Fortunately, the exposures had occurred for a much shorter period of time. A recommendation was moved for the child care center to be relocated. In 2012, a site where a Head Start program was located was identified as having potential contamination with volatile organic compounds in the soil and air beneath some of the buildings. Soil gas samples underneath a building, or sub-slab, were analyzed for PCE, TCE, and DCE from a building that housed the Head Start program. Generally, concentrations found in sub-slab testing are greater than concentrations occupants of the building are exposed to in indoor air. Indoor air concentrations, however, can be modeled based on that sub-slab result. At the facility, the PCE air concentrations estimated for the Head Start program exceeded the ATSDR acute minimal risk levels for neurological effects and created a possible increased cancer risk for children. Also, the PCE, TCE, and DC level, DCE levels all exceeded the ATSDR chronic minimal risk levels for neurological effects. ATSDR recommended that indoor air samples of facility on the property be conducted as soon as possible to capture accurate results. The contaminants on the site caused a great deal of concern for health professionals and for the parents whose children attended the Head Start program. On ATSDR's recommendation, further indoor air testing was completed, and the indoor air testing revealed that indoor air concentrations were below a health concern. However, there remained a concern that indoor air concentrations could rise in the future if environmental conditions changed. Because of increased awareness and potential risk, the Head Start was relocated. So we're concerned with several types of environmental exposures that can occur at early care and education programs. To briefly discuss how children can be exposed to these chemicals from these environmental exposures, there's a graphic from EPA that helps depict some of the ways children can be exposed. So one is soil. Children often play outside and are in frequent contact with the soil. Sometimes they incidentally ingest soil. Contaminants in soil can also be tracked into our spaces on dirty shoes or from bringing objects inside and outside. Any contaminants brought inside from soil can again be an exposure to young children who crawl on the floor or are in more contact with the floor. Drinking water is often a way children are exposed to environmental contaminants. Some chemicals can enter the groundwater from on-site or nearby contamination. Although public drinking water systems have requirements for routine testing of contaminants, requirements for testing of private drinking water supplies can vary. Outdoor air can also have contaminants from multiple nearby sources, and indoor air can have contaminants from sources including materials used in the indoor environment, but there's also concerns about indoor air quality being impacted from things such as chemicals seeping into the indoor air from vapor intrusion from contaminated soil or groundwater. So when we often talk about the safe siting of early care and education programs, we're frequently asked, how big of a national problem is this? We tried to address this in 2016. We used some GIS data to try to estimate the burden of the problem of ECE programs located on or adjacent to incompatible sites. Using a child care data set from Homeland Security and a data set from known contaminated sites, we were able to come up with some of the following information. We found that of about 115,000 child care facilities across the United States, if you look at all the different sites they were adjacent to, 76% are around potentially contaminated sites. So the types of sites that were looked at were brownfield sites, Superfund sites, formerly utilized defense sites, resource conservation and recovery act sites, and also major air emission sources. However, the GIS information is a great resource, but to understand some of the environmental problems, there are important data limitations using GIS data to try to predict the number of problematic early care and education sites. First, the data on the previous slide discusses only proximity of child care centers to known contaminated sites. Proximity alone is often not a very accurate measure of exposure. Sometimes you can be very close to contamination but have no exposure at all. Second, the data set from Homeland Security may not be complete as child care facilities may open and close all the time. And third, the Homeland Security data set only includes child care facilities, not home-based or family-based care or other places such as preschools or nursery schools. We were also unsure if Head Starts were included in their database. Fourth, 
contaminated sites we looked at were only the known sites. Across the country, there are many, many sites which we do not yet know to be contaminated. And finally, we picked boundary sizes based on the best science available. Changing the boundary size, for example, the distance between the childcare and a Superfund site, can make a very big difference in the number of child cares within the area of concern. Recognizing that GIS is only one way to capture the burden of the problem, we also looked at other ways to try to estimate the number of early care and education pro programs which could currently be impacted by environmental exposures. The state of New Jersey started a program in 2007 to ensure that licensed early care and education programs were addressing environmental exposure concerns. If we use New, Jer New Jersey as an example, we can try to estimate a national burden. New Jersey has uh, 3,939 licensed centers when we looked at their data. And of those, 17% were found to have potential or actual indoor air exposure concerns. 2.2% needed some type of action to prevent exposures. We also know in New Jersey, there are 72 children per licensed childcare center based on the geometric mean. So if you take the numbers from New Jersey and do some math with them, um, we did some calculations and we determined how many early care and education programs may need additional evaluation to determine they're safe. Based on this assessment, we estimate about 18,700 centers across the United States would have some potential concern, which would be about 1,340,000 children. Again, using some more numbers from New Jersey, if we look at those that have potential harmful contaminants, the 2.2%, um, we end up with about 20, 2,400 centers across the United States, which would be about 174,000 children where they may currently be exposed to harmful environmental contaminants. Again, there's some important data limitations when using the New Jersey data to try to estimate across the United States. First, New Jersey might not be a good representative state. We work with the assumption that their experience would not be unique, but we recognize that it might over or underestimate the problem. Also, we use the number of licensed child care centers across the U.S. We do not include other types of early care and education facilities. And finally, the New Jersey licensing program is largely focused on indoor air exposures. Although they do look for other types of exposures, those exposures may be underrepresented. So cumulatively, across the United States, exposures to contaminated soil, water, or air might be higher. So to review it to this point, we know that young children are vulnerable to environmental contaminants and that many early care and education facilities across the United States may be located on or adjacent to a site which can cause environmental exposures to children. To be proactive in preventing environmental exposures to children, ATSDR developed Choose Safe Places for Early Care and Education and created some objectives for our work. Our objectives included developing a guidance manual for safe siting of early care and education programs, to develop materials for how to build a program for safe siting, to include safe siting considerations and licensing at the state level, to include safe siting considerations in federally supported early care and education programs, and to implement safe siting considerations by accrediting organizations and large-scale operators. Tara, can I just uh, pop in here for a minute? Yeah, you're, I'm glad you're talking sure. about this. Everybody's going to be re receiving the manual via email uh, after this webinar. We'll also be posting a replay in case you want to share this webinar with others. Is it okay if I ask a couple of questions now, or would you prefer I wait? Yeah, that's probably fine. Okay, good. So we've had some good questions. One of them is you mentioned 25 states have partnered with you in the Apple Tree uh -huh. organization. If there are people here from a state that is not represented, how do they get to be involved in, the, in this partnership? Sure, well, a lot of our materials are available on our website. Okay. Um, one of the slides later has a link to the website. They can start there and look over the, the materials, mm -hmm. and then they can contact myself, or um, we have ATSDR regional representatives in, in the 10 regions across the United States who'd be happy to talk with them and try to get them some information to help them get started. Good, second question is a good one. What about asbestos level in older buildings? Is this still a concern today or is this pretty much a, a past concern? Well, that's a good question. I would <laughs> say that, you know, especially older buildings, if they're being renovated, 
are buildings that could potentially have asbestos disturbed materials, which can then um, lead to asbestos in that environment. Mm. So that's why we, for our guidance manual, we'll talk about this in a moment, we didn't go into um, specific guidelines about every contaminant, but we were hoping that programs would develop where the state health departments and the licensing departments could work together. So health officials could answer some of those questions about a specific individual site. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then we've got two questions here on on financial assistance. The first one is, is there federal or other funding for actual environmental site assessments as part of this work? These costs are a big challenge for ECE programs. So if if you want to get a site evaluated, is there funding available for that? At the moment, I don't believe there's any federal funding available for doing specific environmental health assessments. Mm -hmm. But as we go through a little bit of the manual, we talk about how, um, you know, a lot of sites likely don't need um, a lot of in-depth environmental sampling. Sometimes you just need to review what was there before, what's next door, and then you can target sites that are higher risk for having Mm -hmm contaminant problems. Right. So it really is about a risk assessment based upon what the history of the site was. Right. Or what's currently going on next to the site. Right. And then the final one is if if a daycare center has to relocate, is there any financial assistance available for this? Or does this have to be obtained through a lawsuit or daycare centers don't have a lot of money for this kind of thing? Is there any way they can get financial assistance? That's another good question. Uh, I think from my position, I probably am can't answer that very well because a lot of those might be legal issues and Mm -hmm. I'm not a lawyer. From the ATSDR side for our agency, we do not have funding for that. But what would happen at like a state or local level or I I can't answer legal question. Okay. So why don't we continue? And if people have more questions, we'll ask them at the end. So go ahead with your uh, description of the guidance manual, Tara. Thanks. Okay. And thanks everybody for your questions. Keep asking them. So Our first objective was to create a guidance manual that could be used by many different types of professionals. We envisioned that the main audience for the manual would be state health department staff. However, we tried to create a manual in such a way that many others from licensing officials to local authorities to even providers or parents could gain some helpful information from the manual. The manual is broken into chapters, so we'll explain a little bit more. So chapter one and two covers um, a lot of what we've already described today with background and the problem and why this work is important to keep kids safe. And some of the content of the remaining chapters we're going to talk about as we move forward. So when we started our work at ATSDR, we needed to decide how we would define what safe places would include. We decided that our definition of safe places would include the thoughtful analysis of four key elements. These elements are the former use of the site that might have left harmful substances, the migration of harmful substances onto the site from other sites, nearby infrastructure or activities, the presence of naturally occurring harmful substances, and access to safe drinking water. So ATSDR has a specific congressional mandate to address environmental contaminants. When we wrote the guidance manual, we kept to issues that fall within the scope of our mandate. Some of these issues on this slide that you see here, such as odor, noise, maintenance issues, natural disasters, uh, sun exposure, although they're very important health and safety issues, they fall outside the scope of ATSDR's mandate. Because we recognize these issues are important, however, we tried to provide links to other resources that can help address these issues if people have concerns about them. As mentioned, the first element to consider in safe siting is past use of the site. Chapter four of the manual is the portion of the manual that talks about these elements that need to be considered. Considering the past use of a site to determine if a site's a good choice is one of the first things you can look at for an early care and education location. On the slide, there's some photos of site, which might make one ask the question, what was here before? On the right, there's a pretty obvious abandoned mill where, again, you might find some contaminants such as asbestos, mercury, or other metals. On the left is a brownfield site, which now looks pretty harmless, really, but there is soil and groundwater contaminants that were left behind. So some sites are obvious, and some might not be so obvious. It's also important to note 
that there are some sites that can look pristine but have hidden contamination. For example, former agricultural land can have contaminants from pesticides that are still in the soil. The second element to consider is safe siting is the nearby sites. Nearby sites can also generate contamination that can harm children. In our work on this issue, we found several examples of nearby sites that are problematic. Examples include sites such as childcare centers located in strip malls or adjacent to dry cleaners. These two shared air handling, which allowed the chemicals from the dry cleaner to enter the indoor air space of the childcare center. Other possible examples, um, we try to put some photos on the slide, are the use of pesticides adjacent to a site or nail salons. There are probably many more types of potentially problematic sites. So asking what is near this early care and education center can help start the conversation about the appropriateness of the location. Naturally incurring contamination can happen across the country from many different types of contaminants. The slide on the map is of nitrate contamination in shallow groundwater across the United States. Naturally occurring contamination can be found in soil, drinking water, or indoor air. We felt it was important to include the consideration of this when an early care and education center is being located on a site by asking, is this location a risk for any naturally occurring contaminants? Is a good way to start considering this element. And finally, the fourth element, access to safe drinking water. Safe drinking water is critical for everyone. There are different types of water systems which are described in this section of the manual. And different water systems may need different actions to ensure that they are providing safe drinking water for children. Also included in the manual is information on how to build a safe siting program at a state or local level. We highlight several elements that will help make the program more successful. Within the manual, there's also information and examples from the state of Connecticut on how they built their program and examples of a sort of generic model program. Some key elements for states to consider to build programs based on the Choose Safe Places strategy include building partnerships, identifying problematic sites, how they'll follow up on problematic sites, and providing education, outreach, and awareness. There are many influences on individual early care and education programs. This graphic is, a, is an oversimplification of some of those influences and how the various entities interact. The work that ATSDR is doing with Choose Safe Places for Early Care and Education in the guidance manual, we hope will strengthen the link between health departments and state licensing authorities. We feel the connection between these two groups is critical to help ensure early care and education programs are well located. In our discussion with many states, Historically, there's been very little interaction between state health departments and licensing authorities for issues related to environmental contaminants. Also important are local departments and local zoning and planning, which can also help decide where early care and education programs are located within their cities, towns, or counties. Tara, can you go back to that flowchart again there? A question, state licensing, the state level, I know there are a lot of requirements that an ECE location has in order to get their license. And that yep. usually has to do with, you know, as you mentioned before, you know, the internal safety or what's going on in the site itself. Is mm -hmm. this program going to expand to where the license will be dependent upon the location of the of the building itself? Is that going to be happening over time, do we think? From the ATSDR perspective, we developed the materials we developed, including the guidance manual, to give states or individual locations a wide variety of options to consider how they want to address this issue. Mm -hmm. So from our perspective at the federal level, we tried very hard not to be very prescriptive in how we think that these issues should be addressed, but tried to give some general information um, to provide some resources and technical support and to really let the individual states or local authorities come up with a program that works for them. Mm -hmm. So in the manual, we um, include information on how the state of Connecticut started their daycare safer program. Um, and SAFER stands for Screening Assessment for Environmental Risks. Connecticut is an ATSDR Apple Tree Cooperative Agreement state, and they developed a non-regulatory based program of collaboration between the state health department and the state licensing department to protect children from environmental exposures. So since 2007, when they started their SAFER program, they've successfully identified um, potentially problematic sites and protected children from environmental exposures. 
With few additional resources, Connecticut has so far identified 46 potentially problematic sites, but only five of those 46 had contamination that required actions to protect children. So this, again, is a, a little bit what we talked about before, that if you look for these sites, you're likely going to find many sites that might need a little bit more investigation. But then what we hope is that the number of sites that actually need some intervention would be far fewer. The success of the Connecticut Safer Program highlights that although sites may be problematic, far fewer sites would need action. And as a side note, if you look at the number, the 46 potentially um, problematic sites out of the about 1,500 child care centers that are licensed in Connecticut, it's really about 3% that had potentially problematic issues, which is sort of similar to the New Jersey data that we looked at. We'd also like to highlight a success story in Connecticut. So there was a site that had a child care center that was adjacent to an active business that provided child care for their employees. So the business and the child care center were on former agricultural property. The business portion of the property was part of a state cleanup program, but the child care portion was not. Arsenic and pesticides were tested for and found on the business property, but the child care center was never tested. Because of the SAFER program, it was recognized that the child care center may be on a site where children are exposed to past contamination. Testing of the soil found arsenic levels above the state cleanup standards, and the contaminated soil was removed and clean soil was brought in to stop any exposures to children. To help expand the Choose Safe Places for Early Care and Education, in the current three-year apple, apple tree program cycle, which started in April 2017, the apple tree states will include safe siting work activities into their ATSDR funded work. This is really exciting as 25 states across the country begin to work on this issue. And we recognize that many states will be in lots of phases of this work. Some states may be just starting out and other states will be more advanced. ATSDR stands ready to assist the states at every level. And we have asked the states to complete specific tasks to begin their work, including assessing the current landscape of safe siting. So kind of looking at what's already going on within their state around this issue developing partnerships with key stakeholders, and that can be um, licensing officials, uh, accrediting agencies, large-scale operators within their states, or local zoning planning folks. We've also asked them to look at uh, policies or other programmatic approaches to addressing safe siting for prospective early care and education centers. We at ATSDR have encouraged the states who are starting on this project to consider first focusing on child care centers or early care and education facilities that are just starting the licensing process to try to prevent them from being placed on a site that's inappropriate before the kids are in the care center and before operation begins. So that's, we really encourage them to start working on the ones that are just um, coming into the licensing right now. And then we've also asked them to um, implement and evaluate the approaches they're taking to address this issue. How would a normal person find what the building's history is? Is there a way to find out what the history of a particular building is that you recommend? Yeah, that's a good question. It might depend on where you're located. Some states have information that's publicly available through um, state databases on known contaminated sites within their state. Mm -hmm. um, other times you might have to go to sort of the local authorities in that area and and ask about it. Um, sometimes you can look at the tax records of a site and see, uh, get some information that way. Who, who owned that site in the past, like who, how it changed hands over time, that's usually publicly available information. Right. And a lot of places that's now available online. Mm -hmm. So good. Those would be some places to start. Good, thanks. Sure. So to assist professionals with building a Choose Safe Places program within their own state, territory, um, tribal area, or locality, ATSDR created these uh, products that are available on our website, and the website um, is located at the bottom of the screen. You can see the website address. But if you Google ATSDR and choose safe places, it should also take you there. Um, so first, we created the guidance manual, which we've talked about today. We have several fact sheets available. We're creating an interactive web-based tool um, for people who are just starting thinking about this process to go through and it allows you to click 
some things you're interested in, and then it gives you a, a list at the end of um, information that you'd be interested in. We're doing webinars to stakeholders and other presentations. Uh, we also have this really great and fun short promotional video on the website. Uh, it's only about a minute long, and you can use it to get other people interested in this topic. Um, we're also doing support to um, our state health department. We have a cooperative agreement with NACHO, um, also the Children's Environmental Health Network and the Environmental Law Institute. And our collaboration with Children's Environmental um, Health Network is some excellent synergy of work being done for all of us to protect children from chemical exposures. The Children's Environmental Health Network has resources available to address a lot of the environmental issues that are outside of ATSDR's mandate. And they also have their own um, Eco Healthy Child Care Program, which is a separate program that they run uh, where people can seek, child care owners and operators can seek voluntary endorsement from them. You can find more information on their website. So we hope that as the Choose Safe Places programs develop across the United States, they can become sustainable and keep protecting children long into the future. Some things to consider to build on sustainability include um, building strong partnerships between all the entities that have a stake in the early care and education facilities. Encouraging programs to start small and scale up as they achieve success. So again, this could be um, starting to look at the, the places that are seeking licensing and try to address those sites first. And then as success is achieved, branch out and maybe get the sites that are coming up for relicensing or start looking at the sites that are already in operation. Um, we encourage everyone to use the best science available to understand um, toxicology and contamination of the sites and to evaluate their programs to determine success. We also hope that adopting new practices, once they're implemented, they become self-sustaining. So once um, people get used to doing these practices for considering what was at the site before, what's adjacent to the site, that it'll just start happening and then go long into the future. So some conclusions. Considering safe siting helps prevent environmental exposures to children and staff in early care and education programs. The safe siting programs can strengthen partnerships between child care licensing, health departments, and others. And safe siting programs can be started and sustained with few resources and can have positive impacts. Now we have time for questions. Great, Tara. We've got a really great list of questions. I appreciate everybody's enthusiasm about this webinar and the topic. In your schematic before, where you showed all the different agencies and departments that work together, huh? one of the questions is, why are environmental agencies missing from the diagram, if they are? Uh, and I guess the bigger question is, are environmental and health agencies working together on this kind of project? Yeah, that's a good question. So we didn't mean to exclude environmental agencies <laughs> if they're working on this project. I think we were trying to show um, a lot of the main influences and from our um, discussions with states and also looking at the child care licensing regulations, we tried to hit on the ones that are uh, frequently mentioned in licensing regulations. So for example, uh, many times if you want to get a child care license, or early care and education license, you need to have um, local inspections from local health departments or uh, fire safety inspections sometimes happen at the local level. Again, the child care licensing at the state level, they're another one. Mm -hmm. And I think the question about uh, environmental health agencies working with health department agencies, I think that really varies state by state. I think in some states <clears throat> they work uh, very closely, very frequently, and in other states, uh, there's a bit more of a divide there just because they reside in different departments within states and so they don't have as much interaction. It's a similar issue with the child care licensing and the health departments. In some states, they're all housed under one umbrella for um, maybe something like health and human services within the state, mm -hmm. but in other states, they're in totally separate departments and they just rarely get to have a lot of contact with each other. Right. Good. So this really is a state-by-state -state condition. And as you said, I think the objective for ATSDR is to provide the information and make it available. And it's really the states and the local locales that have to pick up the initiative. 
Yes, we, we didn't feel as a federal agency that we could possibly um, create a guidance manual to address every state or territory or local sort of situation. Mm -hmm. And so we tried to create the guidance manual and other materials in a way that people can take them and then use them in a way that makes sense for where they are. Right. Good. Another question. Um, you talked uh, about addressing safe siting for prospective programs, but the question is, what about ECE facilities that already exist? Again, I know, uh, presuming this has got to be a state-by-state -state plan, but in the example of Connecticut or Pennsylvania mm -hmm. or wherever else you have these programs, is this just looking at new facilities or are they going back and looking at existing facilities as no, well? So, for example, the, the one in Connecticut, that that was a child care that was in operation and they found it as they were looking back, looking at the list of licensed child care facilities with the known um, contaminated sites within the state. And they, they saw that overlap. Um, that's my understanding of how that site was identified. Mm -hmm. um, it was in operation already. And in that case, you know, they worked in that case, the state health department worked with, I believe the, the business owner, and the state um, environmental department to get that site addressed. Mm -hmm. I don't have all the details, so I don't want to speak out of turn about exactly what happened. Right. But um, that was a facility that was already in operation. I think the benefit of trying to identify um, these locations as operators or are applying for a new license is that you can potentially prevent um, the site from being placed somewhere where it shouldn't be to begin with. It's a lot easier to say, um, you know, move a potentially located child care right. center than one that's already in operation with kids there and parents attending it. And it creates a lot of concern for the parents and for everyone else in the community. So if there's a way to start a program where as the licensing um, application is happening, there can be some checks on that in a way that makes sense for the state or local entities, then that, that's probably an easier way than waiting till you catch them once they're in operation. Mm -hmm. Good. Another question, EMFs, uh, which I believe is electromagnetic frequency, um, seems to be a gray area. Are there any reliable science-backed conclusions about safe levels for EMFs and, and EMF yeah. waves? That is a good one. Um, so again, that's that's an issue that's a little bit outside of our ATSDR mandate um, based on what we were assigned to do um, under the Superfund legislation. Mm -hmm. So we, um, I can't remember if off the top of my head we linked to that one, but there are some, CDC has some um, resources about EMF. They're not specifically linked to childcare. Right. Um, but there are some information out there. Okay. So that would be like, uh, you know, locating a child care center under high power lines um, right. just as an example. Okay, good. And, you know, these are issues that, although ATSDR from, um, our agency perspective, um, you know, we, we have to kind of not weigh in on them too much. At the state or local level, um, local health departments or um, state health departments, you know, they might be able to provide some additional guidance if there are specific rules or um, within a state or local level. Right. So I don't want to say there's none out there because there could be some places that already have some um, rules about that for child care. Great. Another question. These are all great questions, folks. Um, really appreciate these. Has ATSDR provided this information to the health department in a particular state, or who's the main agency you've worked with in developing these apple tree partnerships? And I guess the question is, if, if your state is, you know, if a state is not participating, where would people go to say, hey, this program exists and you've been told about it. Let's get this going. <laughs> yeah. So, on our uh, ATSDR website, there is the list, there's that green map, which has more detail about some of the states, the apple tree states. Mm -hmm. So you can look to see if your state is already one of our cooperative agreement states. And uh, 
that's a good place to start. Um, the cooperative agreement is a three-year cooperative agreement. So um, there's one that just started in 2017. So it'll be a few years until that cooperative agreement opens up again. However, um, we're uh, always willing to talk to people um, within states that are apple tree states. And I'm always happy to talk to people who are not in those states as well and you know talk about some ideas or try to link up with resources that might be available mm -hmm. okay good with the new leadership at the epa which seems to have a deregulating agenda is there a okay. chance the agencies that you're talking about will lose funding or be shut down <laughs> oh goodness that's a this tough is question. probably well outside of what i can answer right. <laughs> <laughs> you know there's a lot of um uh, there's a lot in that question. I, I would say that what we hope is with many partners working together on this, if you involve a lot of your stakeholders, your licensing folks, the health people, you know, some of the environmental health agencies, um, maybe local zoning and health, you know, if, if you can think of people that you can partner with and um, get some synergy going around um, these issues and topics or, or try to come up with a program at a level that works for you, that hopefully that has power to sustain itself moving forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I can't answer that question. Yeah, it's a big one, but it's a good question. Crystal's asking, is it going to become mandated for child care facilities to have the land checked prior to even starting the building of a center or ECE facility? Yeah, that's, that's again a question that would come down to what is included in uh, the state licensing regulations within a state. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, it's possible states could put language like that into their state licensing regulations. Uh, we don't uh, tell states what to put in regulations. That's all at the individual state level. Our our guidance manual is really just a guidance manual to talk about this issue and to give some ideas about how to address these problems. Mm -hmm. um, we don't set policy or regulation. We're non-regulatory, our agency. So right. that would really have to be sort of a state by state decision. Great. And then there, uh, another question about follow-up. So we're having this webinar today and people are interested, they're attending. Is there going to be further communication with the folks who've registered here or a way they can stay in touch with what's going on? What's, what's the oh, plan for communication there? That's a really good question. Well, I'd encourage everyone to check out our website and see the materials we have available there. We also have a dedicated um, email inbox you can send questions to and we can try to get you to someone who can answer your question quickly uh, and people are welcome to reach out to me uh, we can include my contact information Jonathan, okay on that um, so i think there's several ways we can try to i think the website probably moving forward might be a, a good place for people to check and we can try to keep updated information on there as we move forward Great. we hope in the next you know, since uh, 25 of our cooperative agreement states just started um, working on this issue that we hope in the next several years, as we get information back from our state cooperative agreement partners about what um, the, the projects they're working on or what they're seeing out there in terms of um, how many sites they've had that are problematic or what their challenges are, that we can support them and come up with additional materials or talk about all the lessons learned in a way that helps others move forward as well. Right. And there are a number of other questions here, which I'm not going to ask, which which talk about who's got the authority and and um, and how do you get reinspection? This I, I think the lesson from this is ATSDR is providing the information and the facility for this. It's really up to the state level. And I think it, it really comes down to, you know, the citizen level, as you saw before with some of the case studies that, that Tara mentioned, that a lot of this was really driven by uh, upset parents. Um, so I think this really is about, as Tara talked about before, creating energy within your locale or your state to start dealing with this very major issue. As we can see from the projections, we've got over one point one million children, I believe, Tara said that, um, you know, are potentially in um, contaminated sites. So we really need to take up the energy at the local level uh, to pursue this. But, but 
ATSDR is providing really great informative and eye-opening uh, information about how you can get this going locally. Tara, thanks very much. Do you have any last words for us? No, I just thank you everybody for participating today. Again, you can reach out to us with additional questions. We'll try to get them answered as quickly as we can. And we're really excited about this work moving forward. And we hope um, across the country it grows and more and more kids are, we're sure, are in safe places. Great. Thanks so much, Tara. Tara Summers, who's uh, the Director of Division of Region 1 uh, at the ATSDR, which is in the Northeast. But as Tara mentioned, there are, I think, 10, 10 regions, and all these regions are up to date on the program, so you can connect with your local ATSDR representative. Uh, my name is Jonathan Marks. I'm from Inkwell Medical Communications. Thanks, everybody, so much for attending. Uh, this has been a great webinar. Thank you, Tara. Thank you to the ATSDR for putting this uh, program together, and we'll be in touch. Take care.